our next panel is going to discuss uh, the value of sporting talents, and we've got a fantastic array of people with uh, a broad range of experience for you. We've got Ben Blanco, who is Head of Sports and Entertainment Marketing at Samsung. Ben, come on down, wherever you've got to. Brilliant. Ben's here. Thank you. Caroline McAteer, who's the founder and chief executive officer of the sports PR company. She basically spotted a gap in the market uh, for David Beckham and, as you can see, has been extremely successful. Um, Graham Swan, who was, is England's second leading um, wicket-taker for spinners, so thank you very much, an Ashes winner, County Championship winner as well. And Richard Thompson, who's chairman of MNC Saatchi and also um, Merlin and the 2-4 group as well, so huge... Um, experience between them. And Ben, I wanted to start with you because Samsung seems to me a, a, an incredibly um, interesting platform, uh, but a way also of, of gauging what sports fans are interested in. So who are the people that make the most impact? What sorts of, I mean, you don't have to name names, but what sort of person really breaks through in terms of sports talent? Um, I think for us, it does come down to how you use them. Um, and I think in any, any sponsorship we're looking at, uh, whether it's a, a, a piece of talent or it's a, a federation, it's kind of what are we trying to get out of it? Because we then need to align that person with what we're trying to do. So it's very easy to look at who's the person of the moment or who might win that gold medal or how many Twitter followers you've got. But if, and sometimes that works for brands. But if that's what you're doing and something doesn't quite happen, it's going to fall down. So with our guys, obviously, we look for... Um, how engaging they are, the type of brand we are, you're talking about the technology, you know, we're that end piece of technology that people are viewing sport through, so it's really important to us that they're engaging with us, it's no good to have a, an ambassador that can't wait to get home and uh, look at that other tablet and phone device that people can buy out there, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, so they've got to be really engaging and I think, you know, something obviously we did recently that I, people saw in the School of Rugby, um, that was obviously with Jack Whitehall and was really important that we had the personalities because we needed to engage emotionally with the audience. So some sportsmen, regardless of how, or well, rugby players, regardless of how great they were, might not have quite worked. And um, again, sorry to anyone in the, the audience, a current player, but that's probably why we went more down the legend route as well because it was a little bit more um, free and unrestricted and they weren't worried about what they were going to say or the impact on the team. I also, I have to commend you, I loved your inclusion of Maggie Alfonsi in that as well. I just she was the it's, star. Yeah, it, she was the star, you're right. Um, we, we'll talk as well about the, the numbers of people that you are able to reach through your social media channels, but Caroline, um, obviously I teased there the, the David Beckham transformation and after the 98 World Cup when he got sent off, you... Did you know him already? Were you yes. working with him already? I wasn't working with him already. I, my background was in music, um, so I was working on Spice Girls for my sins. Um, <laughs> and so David was around. <laughs> and then, um, so I, I knew him just kind of socially. And then when he got sent off in the World Cup in 98, he went out straight to Victoria on the Spice Girls tour. Um, and he was obviously getting a lot of bad press. There was effigies in the front pages. And I couldn't understand. I was like, who's your PR? Like, who's, who's dealing with this? And he was like, I don't have anyone. And that's when I realised that sports people didn't have media-specific people. So it was just their football agent that did everything. Um, so I said, you need to get this under control. And what was your approach? How did you do that? Um, well, first of all, it was just trying to manage the stories that were being run because it was a lot of just absolute rubbish that was being written around that time. So it was trying to take control of that. And then much longer term, we had like a two year plan on just trying to build his profile and trying to get it back where it should be. That kind of worked, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and are you still work. working with him now? No, I stopped working with him in 2004. We so we did about um, just over seven years. And, and during that sort of arc, what, what would you consider the breakthrough moment when you thought, yes, we've corrected this that could have gone horribly wrong? Um, for a long time, because the UK media were so against him because of what had happened, we did a lot of international press. So we spent most of our time doing stuff in Japan, in Asia, um, America, everywhere else. So we kind of worked on building his global um, image much more than the UK focused. And then slowly we started doing bits and pieces with key journalists and building those relationships within the UK. So I think it was over a probably like two, three year period when it changed. And I think really the only time when he saw it really change was when he got the captain's armband for that first game and Peter Taylor picked him. And he thought, OK, I'm back, basically. And now he's God, so it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> do you only work with sports talent now or do you still work yes. with music? Just sports talent. Just so sports talent. set up the agency yes. because of... 
Well, that yeah, once I realised that sports people didn't have that kind of support, um, it just seemed like a really obvious thing to do. And also because of the way the media was going, it seemed like footballers were on the front page as much as they were on the back page, and no one was, no one was doing it. We'll talk in a moment about, about whether clubs and um, national organisations actually understand PR or care at all about it. Um, it's quite an interesting story on that. Um, but Graham, as, a, a, as somebody who's only really just left the dressing room, I don't mean that literally, but you know what I mean. Um, when you're playing for your country, how aware are you of your own individual PR or indeed the, the image of the team? Um, you are fairly aware of it, more because of uh, what we heard earlier about knowing what you can't say, what you can and what you can't. Um, all team coaches, all uh, captains are very paranoid about the wrong message being uh, put out there. So everything is very controlled. Um, if you have individual sponsors, you're told, look, you can't say this, you can't say that. Toe the party line almost. It's like a chief whip behind the scenes. Um, and so you're aware of it because of that. Um, when you retire, it's, it's an incredible feeling because suddenly the first thing you do um, you think, oh, I can say what I want now, but then you realise you've not really got anything to say. Because <laughs> you've, 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 Haven't any you've, thoughts you've turned for into years. A robot. And it's a real shame. Um, I, always, I was very lucky that I had eight years out of the team where I decided when I got back in, you know, this could be my last game anyway, so I don't care what they say. I'm going to be a bit of a character. I'm going to try and create a career for myself afterwards. Um, it happened to go really well uh, for five years, probably because of that, because I put no pressure on myself. But these guys coming through now, say Joe Root, when he first got in the team, he was incredible in the change room and in the press. He was cheeky. He was, you know, he was like your annoying little brother or something in the change room. But he was brilliant to have there. And then David Warner punched him in a nightclub, which was completely not Joe's fault. Um, I can possibly tell you why he did it later on if you pay me well enough. Um, <laughs> But because of that, and, and Andy Flower got very frightened by that, by his sort of young star, Joe, um, being in this media spotlight. Joe's now a robot, like the same as everyone else. His interviews now, if he gets 100, he, the first thing he used to say, wow, I've got 100 at large, my gran will be off at moon. Um, <laughs> and now he'll say, oh, I've got to thank my teammates, I couldn't do it without them, which, which is great from a team point of view, but from a personal, uh, a viewer's point of view, a sponsor's point of view, it's bland, it's... It's not exciting. And do you think it's because the, the, the setup doesn't understand how to crisis manage if there is a crisis and doesn't understand the power of personality when you get a good one, let them be? Maybe. I, I think they just fear it. They fear a personality because uh, their, their best way of prevention is, you know, never let this happen. Control everything, you know, like a nanny state almost. Don't let any personality come through and then you can control everything. But ultimately, someone will come through in the new generation and sort of not be the, the model athlete and everything, and he'll be loved by uh, the whole world and he'll rewrite the rules again. Um, Richard, how much have, have you seen it change and, and not necessarily always for the best? Well, interesting, I managed Freddie Flintoff and thinking back to kind of Freddie's personality, he was probably the last of that generation of genuine mavericks. He was also probably the last of that terrestrial generation where you know he's in everybody's home, unlike where we, where we are now with cricket. But I think social media has changed everything. Every time you tweet, that's a press release. Um, and I think there's been good examples of current sportsmen where they tweet at the wrong time of day or the wrong frame of mind. Um, and that can undermine all the good work you as the agent or manager are trying to do in the background. Um, so I think because of that, that's put them, some have become more guarded. Um, but I think the authenticity of who they are is so important. You kind of, people see through it. I think the example that Graham just gave is, is a good one that, you know, they do get slightly caught in the spotlights. And if your coach and your plan for England is telling you to behave like that, you will behave like that. And, you know, you're not going to do anything to jeopardise your England place regardless of who you are. And when you're dealing with people whose careers will only last at their peak until maybe they're 30, in some other sports it can go on a bit longer into their 40s in, in racing, for example. But you have got to build some sort of long-term career for them. H how do you do that and when do you start doing it? While they're still playing or after they finish? As early as, early as possible. I mean, there's too many examples. And actually, um, even, even David, to some extent, there's certain deals that he's done post-playing. I mean, his success is a phenomenon. It's a one-off. But what a lot of players don't necessarily do are to create deals that are generating royalties or they've got equity participation in something. So when you're hot, you're going to get the great deals. Ben Blanco is going to be calling you and you're going to get in the Samsung ad. But when you're not, that goes. But what you need is to be making money when you've retired. And to do that, when you're at the peak of your career, you should be thinking of, of encouraging clients to, 
start small businesses or invest in things and to do things that will still allow them to get the bigger deals. But when they're retired, they've got something to fall back onto. And I think they don't capitalise on that moment. Because as you said, that moment in the sun is very brief. Um, and they think that when it's too late, when they're beginning to reach the twilight. Uh, Matt Dawson is a good example of somebody who you created, a, a, a helped create a, a mm. post-playing career for, and very successfully. Well, I mean, a jug-eared, annoying scrum half. I think that, you know, he's an extraordinary character, Matt. But with Matt, we took a risk and said, you've got to retire. He was offered two more years to play for Wasps. He couldn't quite understand why, and it was just that classic example you'd use in business of thinking, well, be the first mover. So if he was the first from, to, from that extraordinary World Cup winning squad of 2003 to get out there and take advantage of the media opportunities, which meant, question of sport, 10, well, 12 years on, he's about to become the longest captain of that particular show that still gets 6 million viewers a week. So to do that and to take examples of the other reality platforms at the time made a huge difference because he was the first one to come out and um, not come out As in any other respect, yeah. but to, 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 to take Actually, advantage that, that, of that value. That brings up a very good point and, and Tom Daly springs to mind on the, on the back of your coming out thing. Tom Daly for me is, is the David Beckham of this generation of sports people. Um, because of his authenticity, actually, and I think that's so important, that he doesn't seem to be pushed too much into being made to do things the way, you know, advisors might tell him to. That actually, even his coming out video, was just, it was just him. There wasn't even well, anything it, branded it, around no, him. No, it was great. <laughs> well, we, we made a show for him, 2-4 Group, oh. Splash. I mean, <laughs> maybe not the best piece of television for a Saturday night, but incredibly Got recommissioned, though. Got recommissioned. <laughs> um, got recommissioned, and it sold as a format, and he shared in his spoils of that. But that opened up a whole new audience to him while he's at his peak. Um, actually, in terms of participation of diving, went through the roof off the back of that show. So as much as you'd have an opinion on the success of the show, it did wonders for his brand and his appeal because you know, he wasn't being used and abused. It was very authentic what he was doing. He was giving advice um, and that helped him cross over. Um, ben, when you, when you do sign up your ambassadors, how much help do you give them and how much do you require of them? Do you, do you say, look, these are the kind of terms and conditions of this deal? Yeah, no, I think back to what everyone's saying, that, you know, we really want to engage with our guys. We don't want to sign an off-the-shelf deal that, you know, all of us that work in sport probably know that quite often than not, a deal is very off-the-shelf as opposed to really bespoke and, and understanding what you can bring to the table. So we don't want to just sign something where it's four appearances and it gets to a month before maybe the, the players have got some time in between club commitments and, and say the national team and you think, oh, what shall I do with that sort of player? It's not like, you know, that, that's not how we work. When we, um, when we signed our three England rugby ambassadors, um, George Ford, Joe, uh, Jonathan Joseph and Joe Launchbury, um, we went to their houses, sent our trainers to their houses, spent the day with them, transferred all their technology over because, again, you know, the type of brand we are, we, we need them to be engaged and, and wanting to work with us as well. It's, it's no... You know, money talks obviously, but we, um, you know, it's no good having someone who maybe is resistant to your brand, and, and that's obviously part of the, the due diligence process before. But you know, we sent people to the house. Um, from that, we then got a phone call from George, he's very you know, family orientated. All of his brothers and his mum had loved the stuff we'd given him, so we're back up there the next week integrating the family into it. So then, all of a sudden, you've got the entire family using Samsung. It started with a deal, of course, and an interest, but. That's how we've kind of engaged with them, and, and it's spread. And now they're real, real fans and ambassadors. We we do, we do lots with those guys. Um, Joe and and uh, and uh, Jonathan were down at Twickenham yesterday, really last minute, but but they were just so keen to do stuff with us, and they like the things we do. We've got something called the Samsung Slider coming. Um, some of you might have seen in the in the social media and on in press, which is a, a four man pod that slides up and down the pitch at Twickenham Stadium. So that'll be at the London Sevens next week. And so that the they fans came down because can... they wanted to see it. I just explain exactly what it is. So it's a, a four-man, bit like this, four seats or yes. a sofa, as someone called it before. It's a four-man pod that yes yeah, sits just behind the LED board, so about a meter. What? Or so two. fans can pay for the role, win the right pay, to can, sit yeah, on it. They can win the chance to sit in it. Um, for how long? For because it's a sevens, we're doing it per game, so we've got 180 rides across the weekend for 15 minutes at a time, and yeah, you go up and down. Not necessarily with the ball sometimes, because <laughs> if the ball gets kicked and then gets kicked back, you could be. But, you know, that's part of the professionalism of it, is it, it goes up and down with play. So you'll be behind the line outs, you'll be rolling up behind the scrums, you'll, you know, you'll hear and feel every tackle. And back to the talent, you know, those guys actually wanted to come down and experience it because they like working with Samson, they know the work we've done them. As, as I think they'll want to for a match as well, are you going to let them? 
we'll, we'll see, yeah, when they're warming up. Yeah. <laughs> um, just your social media channels yeah. have jumped from reaching how many? Uh, I think when I took over, yeah, we were about the 150, 160 mark, and yeah, now we're about two and a half million. And how, and, and, and in, in what format is that coming? Which social media channels? So uh, Facebook. Facebook and Twitter at the moment is from yeah. a, so from a, we have a, a, an independent sport channel as opposed to having everything that we do in sport with our ambassadors on a, on a Samsung UK brand channel. And how much do you, so take the Samsung advert, you know that it made an impact, you know it made people laugh. How much, though, were you judged on did they buy Samsung products? And how can you follow that through? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, we have to, uh, we have to justify what we're doing in marketing is, is working. The you know, sponsorship function at Samsung um, sits within, with, within the broader uh, marketing piece, and hence my title. So we have to justify that. Of course, we're a sales business. There's no good in everyone going, oh, I love those Samsung adverts. They're brilliant. And sales, sales are declining. But the whole reason for that advert, and probably in a, in a sports term, if you think, you know, we ended our Chelsea partnership um, last season after 10 years. Um, if you think where Samsung and Chelsea both were 10 years ago when Roman had taken the, the club over, um, both have absolutely grown unbelievable. And, and Chelsea did an incredible role of awareness for us. Um, what, what we now need to do is emotionally engage with people, make them love the brand, make them feel something towards Samsung and therefore want our product. So that was the KPI of the School of Rugby work as opposed to, Ben, we need you to create something which is going to sit in retail, really shift phones, um, and as you just mentioned, you know, we, we, we drove record levels of, of brand love, product consideration and awareness of Samsung as a sponsor. And there was, of course, then a, a sales uplift. And during that Rugby World Cup period, we sold, um, well, we had our record week of sales um, in phones ever. Um, we closed the gap on, on Apple um, across a number of metrics. So, so we can relate it back that way. But again, it's been really clear about what we were trying to achieve. It wasn't technically about phones in hands. And do you find sport a more effective sales arena than music or entertainment? Um, no, I, I wouldn't say we do focus at Samsung largely on sport. And my, obviously, uh, my title is sport and entertainment. And entertainment actually kind of encompasses everything else, you know, food, uh, film, food, theatre. Um, and we're actually having those discussions at the moment because I've been in the business for sort of three years. The first part of my role was, was the coming out of Chelsea work and I won't bore you all now, but you know, we had like 39 sponsorships just in the UK, all signed across the business for different things. So it was about reducing down, creating a strategy and understanding where we wanted to go forwards. Um, sport we knew was going to be massive in 2016. We were Olympic Games and Paralympic Games partner. We're obviously an England rugby partner with the Six Nations. We've got this slider coming that I mentioned about. We've got something else at the end of the year. But beyond that, we knew we had to shift change. So actually, at the moment, I'm looking at what's our role in music, what's our role in film, um, potentially what's our role in something like food. And um, the agency MNC that we've just brought on board that, that are here are really helping us through that work. Um, well. So I think next year will <laughs> sport will be there, yeah, and then that man there, um, none of his talent, no joking. Um, that you know, sport will, will always be a focus for Samsung. It's something, but we acknowledge that not everybody loves sport, even though a lot of people do. And you only have to see these stats of sixty percent of talk on Twitter is about sport or about live sporting events. And, and Caroline, when it comes to your side of it, of selling a sports talent to to the the company, what what do you say are the advantages? of using sporting talent over music or anything else, or film star. I mean, obviously, George Clooney's probably going to trump everything and everyone, but... <laughs> um, I think it depends on the individual, but with sport, particularly with football, which I mostly work in, because it's so global, the hit that you can get immediately with the player's fan base is, I think, quite... I mean, it's, it's obviously quite impressive for our brand. Like, with Didier Drogba, we did the deal with um, Turkish Airlines. Um, so his... Social media is about, I think it's about 13, 14 million. But the ad, when they dropped it, was watched by something like 55 million people within 48 hours, which for them as a brand is, is huge. Um, so that's where I think as a brand they see the value of, of what the players can bring. The, the flip side of that is it can be very closely linked to performance. So mm -hmm. if suddenly you are losing, mm -hmm. uh, or you do a Lance Armstrong, um, mm -hmm. um, your negative value can be can hugely outweigh the positive. Absolutely. H how do you sort of mediate that? Well, I think it's important, and I think, again, with, with sports people, they have to understand that managing themselves almost like a brand is quite important because, actually, that's what their value is. So much as it's about performance, for a player, you know, if you're photographed 
full night of a nightclub on a weekend, you're not going to be sitting down signing a deal with Samsung or whoever the next week because most brands are not going to want that kind of association. So I think for players, they have to be very careful about how they manage everything. And it goes down to social media as well. If you're putting up negative stuff on social media, again, I think brands look at that straight away and they think, do you know what, that's not an association that we want. So that's where I think we come in, where it's about managing everything that the players do and making sure that everything is done in a professional and correct way that makes them attractive to brands, ultimately. You and Richard worked together on, on, a, on a pretty c crucial um, crisis management point, just to explain who, who the player was and what the situation was. Well, I got a call from Richard at about, cause about 11 o'clock one night saying, can you meet me at my office tomorrow morning? Um, we've got a crisis situation. So I went and met with him and um, one of his clients, Matt Stevens, had just tested positive for cocaine. And um, Matt then came along and myself, Richard and Matt had a conversation about how do we handle this. Um, we decided that the best, the only option really was to come clean um, and do an interview on Sky Sports and just hold his hands up and say, yes, I did it. I made a mistake. This is why. Um, and he was, I mean, he was visibly distraught that morning, wasn't he? he was, I mean, he was very upset about it. So we felt that that was the most honest and straightforward way to do it. Then we did a conference call with uh, Martin Johnson and one of the RFU lawyers who um, told myself and Richard under no circumstances were we to do the Sky Sports interview. What was, um, their, what was their reason for that, Richard? I'm the RFU lawyer might be in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Have we got anyone from the RFU here? Chatham House. Actually, quite interesting. Um, uh, well, the, the response was that obviously they have. I mean, I, I think the strategy that Caroline and I put together, and Caroline is brilliant at this, was to be honest. You know, you can't hide from anything. You had to accept that what uh, Matt had done, it wasn't Lance Armstrong, this wasn't performance enhancing. Um, this was dealing with chronic depression, um, but he broke the rules and um, he's a role model, and that meant possibly the end of his England career. But unfortunately, RFU didn't quite see it that way. Um, and where we felt in a world of social media and so on, you've got to be honest, you've got to deal with this quickly, um, forensically, and, and, and deal with it. And I think the RFU's view is that we were going to start a media circus, is which was their quote, which was ridiculous. Circus. And it, we were doing everything to avoid the media circus, to not create a vacuum, but to be out there uh, and to be honest, um, and to allow people to have some sympathy if they want to with Matt, or not if they don't, but this is it. Um, but the RFU had a very different view. How, how did you, just say again the phrase, they, they, were, they, were they mistrusting both of you, the, yeah. the PR world? Was it them not understanding? Yeah, I think it was just not understanding it because they felt it was going to be a, a celebrity circus and actually what we felt was we did Sky Sports, I think we did the Mail and we did... And the Times. And the Times. Um, and we did it with rugby correspondents because we felt at least if Matt explained what had happened, why it had happened, how he felt about it and also to take responsibility to say actually... I'm taking responsibility, this is my mistake. It almost took the pressure off both his club and obviously um, England, but they were, I think it was more fear than anything. They were just scared of where it was going to be. And actually, I think it worked because, you know, the next day, it was one day, everyone got the story, and then it was done. Whereas if they hadn't have done it like that and we'd have not said anything, it would have carried on for days and days and days of speculation and what happened and who did this. and. It just, for me, managing the story, it was it. And I think Matt came out of it better. I think everyone did. And it almost took the pressure off the RFU because they didn't have to even deal with it then. Matt took all the responsibility. Um, Graham, do, do you sometimes feel that players are treated a, a little bit too much like children? That they're not actually allowed to make adult decisions and have their own voice? Well, absolutely. When, you, when you're in a team, that certainly is the feeling you get, you know, we're being treated like sheep. But in many ways, I can understand it. You are herded around the world, you know, you turn up on time to train and you do this, you do that. Uh, when you go to any um, media interview, the, the ECB, and I assume the RFU and, and the football guys have this as well, a media liaison officer walking you there, telling you what the questions you're about to be answered, asked are, what you will answer, what not to say. And she says, obviously, put your own spin on it if you like, but don't you dare you know, cock up. Um, um, and I had a brilliant relationship with it's Rianne Evans, the girl at the ECB, because I'd say, look, don't even tell me what they're going to ask, first and foremost. 
I'm not going to get you into trouble. I'm not going to get Andy Flower or the ECB into trouble. Uh, I might get myself into trouble, but it, I'll do it in a cheeky way that somehow benefits me in the long term. I'm not here to you know, burn things down. Um, but yeah, you, when you are treated like that, when, because they're so frightened of, of, of things like this. I mean, I, the RFU's um, response to that, I can imagine the ECB doing the same thing. I'm, I'm a word, what's happened? We don't want this celebrity circus. We, we, it's out of control. We can control things if players are controlled. Um, it, I, I think it's a shame, but I think in a lot of ways, sportsmen, they aren't the most intellectually superior human beings in the world. And sometimes they do need to be treated like kids because they live in a bubble where everything is handed on a plate. They don't know the hardship of like a normal working life and, and they can make stupid, childish decisions. And, and did you find during your career that because people could get to you suddenly in a way that they hadn't been able to before, if they wanted to be abusive, they could do it absolutely straight to you through social media? Yeah. Was that a learning curve that you have to go through of how to deal with that? Absolutely. I, I'll, I'll never forget Tim Bresnan on tour and Twitter was in its infancy. And the only reason anyone knew about it was myself and Jimmy Anderson had a competition who could get the most um, followers during an Ashes series. Um, and, it, and he won. Good looks came out over substance, obviously. Um, <laughs> but we carried it he on. He did we, have some great sort of semi-naked photos it, as well. It, yeah, exactly. Which obviously I'm not the target. I'm going to talk about um, before, but lots of people liked it. So. It, was, it was Jimmy's agent who said to him, look, recognise the commercial side of this. You can, this can really work for us. And so we both kept it going. And the other boys started getting on board. And this is you know, back in 2009. So Twitter was very much very young, yeah. a student sort of thing at the time. And Tim Bresnan got on board, and Andy Flower made me our sort of Twitter control expert. Um, <laughs> and he just, I know. Uh, and he just said, look, I'm happy to have Twitter. There can be no swearing at all. And there must be nothing that denigrates this team. I went, fine. So I said to Brez, no swearing, Brez. And his first one, he, someone over-fatted a picture of him, so he was huge. He said, oh, look at you, Brez, been on the pies. And he said, you know, crawl back to your basement, you, like, bleep, 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 bleep. Daily Mail, straight away, front page the next day. So he's hauled over the coals. We told you not to swear, you're going to get it ruined for everyone else. I'm sorry, Andy, I'll never do it again, never do it again. And then his follow-up tweets, who apologised for it, said, just because some dipshit sends a tweet. <laughs> But, I mean, even then, when we said, what are you doing? He says, dipshit's not swearing. <laughs> <laughs> Which kind of goes back to that, you know, sportsmen are children in many ways. So. Yes, right, let's take some questions from the floor, because we've got, we've got 11 minutes remaining. I have this wonderful cube, so who would like to ask a question on the value? So, and actually, I haven't, what I haven't asked so far is how you increase the value of sporting talent. So you, I might let you all think about that and we'll come back to that in a moment. So if you take somebody who you think could be more valuable and when, when's peak time to cash in? You wanting it? No? I'm very happy to continue. You want it, there you go. Sorry, that was a little bit violent. Sorry, straight at your face. I didn't mean to do that. Um, go ahead. We obviously, as spectators, we want entertainers. And I mean, sort of that thing, that's why people are really intrigued by Swanee and less so maybe with guys at the top of the order at the same time. But the entertainers are the guys who get things wrong and sort of like the gases all those kind of people and they're the people who brands don't really want to work with so how can you if you are an athlete create a scenario where you're entertaining you're engaging you get a good following but also you're an attractive proposition for a brand you mentioned Flintoff so I better jump on that one um, I think it worked for Flintoff um, what, and, and you know you think of Giacomo I mean they're not the most sexy ads in the world but it's very authentic it's for bigger guys he's a bigger guy um, and those ads work well as did Morrison's I think if it is that's the personality and you're trying to get the essence of that personality out, then it definitely works. But it works differently when you're not playing anymore because you don't carry the same risk of potentially your governing body deciding that you've taken the thing into disrepute or whatever. So I definitely follow on Graham's point. It's very different to being post-playing and currently playing, which is probably why Samsung didn't use current players during a World Cup because that could have backfired. Um, but I think if the person's being authentic, I mean, I can think of some horrific adverts with um, Steve Redgrave with a parrot on his head for Admiral. I mean, all the money in the world, or even, bless him... Uh, Des with the right guard advert, do you remember that? Yeah. I mean, I'm just thinking of Tom Daly as well, where he did that ad for um, Nestle. 
um, which didn't run for very long, but another one that you just felt he'd rather be eating his toenails than doing that ad again. So <laughs> there, there is that sense that the Lovely talent needs to, be, uh, <laughs> need to be wanting to do the ad. Um, but it is a big difference. But I think you know, there's far fewer personalities you could pick on now and say, right, go and be yourself. Or who would you choose? I don't think, you know, we don't um, avoid people with personalities at all. I think we've, we've talked across a broad spectrum and obviously at the top you've got the guys like Lance Armstrong or, and not even what happened today because that was different, but where you do have these big crisis moments. And then obviously, you know, we don't want to be with someone realistically you know, that's falling out of nightclubs that we talked about, but we want, you know, we want someone that people love and are so, passionate so about. So where, where would you stand, for example, on Danny Cipriani? Would you... Um, have him as an ambassador or not? I think we're getting into territories of... Uh, no, I, th I think... Someone likes him, with, okay. I think realistically with Danny, I mean, I, I'll be honest, we, we were talking to him about a year and a half ago, um, and, you know, the, the previous... I say they're indiscretions or whatever. I, I think where the law becomes involved as a brand would, right. would be a key thing. And I think where the law becomes involved or something is broken, um, I think you don't have an opportunity to, to, to do anything. You know, you have an obligation to protect your brand and do the right thing. Um, where you are on, maybe not the moral compass, but it's probably down to you as a brand. If, if I was sat here as head of marketing of Paddy Power, I'm going to be looking for those guys. And think of some of the great stuff they've done that, again, was, I mean, you talk about Twitter to begin with, it was like, what are these guys talking about? Swearing and taking the mickey out of people. All of a sudden, the Daily Mail, people like that, are trying to adopt the same tone of voice and, and leading the way. And so, you know, those guys are going to be looking at different ambassadors to, to maybe a, a bank or an insurance company who need an ambassador that's going to go and meet their chairman and have dinner. And, um, but we certainly don't, don't go away from personalities. I just, yeah, I, I don't think any brand would, would want someone that... Uh, um, I remember when, sorry, at LucasAid, when we had Stephen Gerrard, he was a fantastic ambassador for us. We worked with him for a number of years, and obviously, if you remember a few years ago, he got in trouble in a nightclub around picking a song or something, and there was a whole court case around that, and we, we stood by Stephen and, and, until the verdict essentially came about, because we weren't there to judge. Several makes the mistakes, but... Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's not quite as... We're not looking for drones. Do you mind throwing it back there? Thank you very much. Yeah, lovely, nice throw. Beautifully Thanks. caught. Hello. Karma Glue from Hawkeye. I just wanted to understand, um, you know, with the likes of LeBron James and these sort of big personalities, who would be your um, ultimate pick right now? Or maybe a question for Caroline and, uh, and Ben. Um, you know, and, and why, if you could sign anybody? Who's it, who do you think is who is the number one Not including value one, yeah. value sporting <laughs> talent at, right now? Apart, obviously, from Swanee, yes. <laughs> it's really hard to actually pick anyone. Like, a couple of years ago, look at Rory McIlroy coming through, I kind of was quite, and also being Northern Irish, I was kind of watching that, also knowing that, I think, post-Tiger Woods, that golf really needed a bit of a star. But I don't think, if I'm being honest, that Rory's handled his PR in the best way. So that's something that I would, I would love to be able to, to work on, because I think... I think he's got a massive amount of talent and doesn't manage his media properly. Which is actually interesting because you're not looking for the one that's at number one, you're looking for the one who could be number one with your be. help. Yes, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think for, for where the improvement could come. Yeah. I think for me, and this is purely personal, I'm, I'm not, um, you know, if I was maybe to go to a different brand tomorrow and they said, right, you're going to sign one, one person. I think at the moment someone like Anthony Joshua would be up there. Mm -hmm. um, I've been really impressed with him. Again, you, you worry about that world because look what look, look what happened to Amir Khan at the weekend. Obviously, slightly different. And you, you know, I suppose like any sport, but in that sport, you are one punch away from from world champion to being having to go back to the to the bottom and starting again. But something about Anthony Joshua, I just mm -hmm. think the, the excitement he brings to those events, the way in which he's beating people. Um, I mean, he had that the fight against the, the other guy from London. Um, I forget his name now. Um, but that was like a kind of a London street fight. And then obviously he had the fight, the next one, against the, the world champion from, from America and destroyed him in one round. It's like all these different excitement that he's bringing. And um, I he's think he nice comes across too. brilliantly. He's, a really nice guy, he's doing yeah. a Master's, I think, you know, yeah. in spare time. I think he would just be someone that you could do some fantastic stuff with. And I think if he can keep performing as he does, I think he could be a, a huge star. Who would you pick, Graham? Um, well, the apart person myself, you would yeah. no, I'd, I'd the probably, you would want to someone be Someone in sport, weren't. I'd probably pick Mike Ashley and I'd convince him my first job is to sell Newcastle for the, <laughs> for the <laughs> um, 
I don't know. I'd, I'd, I'd go for a golfer as well. I mean, when Rory McIlroy was brought up, I wouldn't go for McIlroy. I'd go for an Englishman who's just won the Masters, Danny Willett, because he's got that little bit of um, little bit of spunk about him. He's very exciting. When he won the Masters, and he's such a like a Yorkshire lad, he was on the phone to his wife. And he, yeah, all right. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I just won Masters. Yeah. Really. Yeah. I mean, how's the baby? I mean, that yeah. for me, I, I'd yeah. be thinking that's the sort of person who. Um, and whether he will go on to be like a megastar of golf, yeah. I certainly hope he does because, you know, I don't want him to be the next Ian Poulter who just pops up for Ryder Cups and, and everyone loves. I want him to be, you know, winning majors all over the place. And I'm playing with him at the uh, Wentworth B BMW PGA oh, yeah. next week. A little so. plug for that. Yeah. Richard, do you th outside of your own stable of talent. A, a, a lot have been mentioned. I mean, Anthony Joshua for sure. And I think Anthony Joshua isn't controlled by that team environment, so he can be himself slightly more, but yeah. it is a, a game. I mean, the, the talent that I think slightly got forgotten in a global sport is Bradley Wiggins. And Bradley kind of occurs to me, think, well, he should be doing a lot more than he is at the moment. So but he can't, because he's training. I'm spending the day of the next week, actually. He's training all the time. But in an Olympic year. I mean, it's what he should but have been banked How can almost. you build it into, and you've worked with people while they ha have still been in full training. How do you build it into their into their week without really ticking Well, you can't off. get it. I mean, Katarina's an example, Katarina Johnson-Thompson, who managed you. You get these very small windows and you need to max them out, and they were probably before Christmas. Um, but you could, they're, they're those opportunities where you can bank content, um, shoot the ad, do whatever you need to do, and then release it wherever, and it won't feel dated. So I think Bradley, it might be too late, but I mean, Bradley is still iconic um, and very British, and I think there's opportunities. Oh, and could, and, and certainly could well, catch him on it I think this year he could become our best ever Olympian. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, hello. Hello. Ah, oh, right. It's <laughs> happening here. Uh, we've got time for one more question. If Dan here at the front, would you mind popping it down? Lovely. It's high class throwing Yes. Catch. Like it. Well done, Love a bit of throwing uh, and catching. Great response from uh, England Hockey. Uh, we've talked a lot about top tier sports, sort of dealing with footballers and rugby players alike. How do you build the value of someone who's from a less well known sport um, and take them into the wider media circus, if you like. Good question, um, Richard. Will you start with social media, I think. I mean, there's a lot more sport entertainment crossover shows that don't necessarily just, you know, focus on the big talent. I can think of League of Their Own, I can think of Play to the Whistle, Question of Sport. Those formats are great for, for talent that might have personality that doesn't get picked up elsewhere. Social media is hugely powerful where they can do a lot to create content, particularly mm -hmm. on Instagram and Facebook, um, which they need probably schooling on. Um, and work with others. I mean, you tend to find lots of sportsmen know other sportsmen, and creating those networks to create little events or opportunities are things they probably don't exploit as much as they could. And actually, you, you, you would have one of the top three, I would say, top three sportswomen in terms of, of one deserving of profile, and that's Kate Richardson Walsh uh, yeah. in, in the country. I mean, and, and she was on my show, absolutely yeah. brilliant. But also, the team have been major contenders for the Action Women of the Year awards, and they've. Mm. And that's, I know that's not national profile, and she certainly deserves to be a lot better known, but hopefully that will still come and she'll have a big year and a big send-off this year. Um, do you want to say anything, Graham? Uh, I, I wouldn't have Building a my, Do mean, you worry at all about, actually, just Rich, while we've got one minute left, you mentioned, you touched on it earlier with cricket being a sky-only sport. Golf, to some extent as well, is now not going to be on terrestrial television. Do you worry at all about profile in this country of those sports that don't have a lot of terrestrial... Rugby and cricket are a yeah. concern. I can think of my colleagues at Embassy Saatchi where we're having to use former talent rather than current talent. Is Joe Root, as a good example, is unrecognisable, but he's the best player in the world. Um, and I think some of the rugby players where so much content sits behind a paywall now... Uh, cricket's been behind a paywall for over 10 years, and I think it is paying the price with some of its top talent now that should be doing more commercially than isn't. So in terms of maximising ta the value of sporting talent, you would say get them the general exposure, get them the big I audience mean, you shows cannot when you can. Generate, the, the value of 6 million viewers on Question of Sport to any talent, to the, if they're in the corporate speaking market or wherever, is huge. And there's very few big, ongoing terrestrial platforms for sportsmen now. So that is an issue to their commercial value and to a brand looking at exploiting a sportsman to think, right, where are they? Where are those rights held? Are yeah. they in front of the paywall or behind? Which is why football continues to be the, the big winner because it has it's got, got a highlights package. It's got both. Exactly. It's got and both. it's got a global market. Yeah. Um, thank you all very much indeed. I, I, fascinating, weren't they? Thank you. Uh, to Ben, to Caroline, to Graham and to Richard, thank you very much. <laughs>